Well, indeed, it's a pleasure to be able to speak to you all this morning. Um, before I begin, I just want to take this opportunity to thank you all, so many of you, for your expressions of kind concern and prayer uh, and gifts to Miriam during this time. We feel like we're in the fight of our lives right now. And so many of you have reached out. I don't know what we would do without the support of our church family. So uh, I thank you uh, on behalf of Miriam and Carolyn uh, as well. Well, it's turning out to be quite an eventful summer, isn't it, folks? <laughs> Mass shootings, the January 6th hearings, ongoing war in Ukraine, inflation, Roe versus Wade overturned. You ever wake up in the morning and you think, surely it can't get any crazier out there, and monkeypox is in the wings going, oh yeah? Right. Lots of people have suggested, on account of the frustration people are feeling about everything, that the dominant characteristic of our day is rage. So the irate passenger, irate uh, airline passenger, Punch, punching the cabin steward or the talk show host just sort of frothing at the mouth over the latest conspiracy theory or the stereotypical Karen stomping her foot demanding to speak to the manager. These are the defining images of the age of rage. You call someone a Karen, they call you back Snowflake. Our civil discourse is descending to this level. I think it's too bad that the name Karen has been co-opted to describe that kind of person. Most of the Karens I know are lovely people. So I'm going, to, I'm going to propose that for this sermon, instead of Karen, we use the name Alex. <clears throat> and if your name happens to be Alex this morning, this is not your lucky day. <laughs> Snowflake. I, I shouldn't have said that. Okay. Our text this morning is, one, is from one of Paul's later letters. It bears all the marks of a mature mind. As he starts to wrap up this letter, at the beginning of our chapter 4, he turns his attention to address a dispute between two women in the church, Euodia and Syntyche. And he asks some unknown friend of his to get involved in the dispute, to help them settle the argument. This is not an enviable task. If someone said to me, Case, you need to get involved in the argument those two women are, happy, are having, I'd say, uh, are you kidding me? <laughs> I, I don't have enough drama in my life, right? And Bible scholars have speculated wildly on what this argument might be about. I mean, really, there's not enough in the verse to tell us. But I suppose if you're writing a commentary that publishers are going to sell for $50, you can't get to verse 2 and go, I don't know, you know your guess is as good as mine. But, but whatever it was about, it must have been generating enough heat for Paul to actually call out names. I mean, that's kind of unusual in a situation like this. Now, if you look at the flow of this passage um, that was read this morning, it kind of makes sense to go from talking about resolving a dispute to rejoicing in the Lord to letting our gentleness be evident to all. 
Because if you think about this for a minute, if it, if it ever is the case that rejoicing in the Lord is secondary, if that's not really important to us, then the one thing we're going to be known for is our disputes, is our arguments. And God knows there are lots of those in the church today. A real eye-opening experience. Ask someone today with no connection to the church or Christianity what they think about Christians. Ask, what do you think is the defining characteristic of Christians? Do you really think these folks are going to go, oh, Christians, those people who are so gentle and gracious whenever they encounter something they don't agree with. I don't think that's the vibe we're giving off. But Paul's train of thought seems to go, our rejoicing in the Lord should make a difference in the way we conduct our lives. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. And did you notice what he follows up with that immediately? The Lord is near. The Lord is near. Not only is the Lord here, ready to help, but of course Paul believes the Lord is coming back soon. It's the one to whom we have to give an account. In the New Testament, gentleness is listed as one of the fruits of the Spirit, along with all the usual suspects like love, joy, peace, patience, and so on. Um, this fruit bowl, fruits of the Spirit, is what John Wesley used to call our tempers. Now that was an archaic way of speaking, and it doesn't refer to emotions. It refers to something like our very basic disposition, our orientation, how we relate to each other. So how is it possible to let our gentleness be evident to all in an age of rage. What about us is evident to all? What vibe do we give off? Students sometimes say to me, Prof, um, you always look so stern, like I'm angry about something. And I have to tell them, look folks, th this is just the bone structure God gave me here. Okay? I I'm not angry probably thinking about lunch, you know. I don't, I don't think of myself as an angry person. Shy? Yeah. Socially awkward? Okay, that's fair. Absent-minded? Oh, <laughs> who are you people? Right? But angry? No. That is most of the time. I suppose, like a lot of you, I have those areas that quickly put me on the boil. The problem in the age of rage is that, is that that most of the time is gradually getting thinned out. And if you don't believe that, I'd like to welcome you all to the world of social media where gentleness goes to die a thousand caps locks. Right? A journalist, Oliver Berkman, recently wrote, now listen to this, we've built a world that's extremely good at generating causes for anger, but extremely bad at giving us anything constructive to do with it. The twisted genius of social media, he says, is that it seems to provide something constructive to do by engaging with posts when all that usually does is just generate more, more anger. Hmm. So perhaps I can sum up as follows, and some of you will know the song lyric, despite all my rage, I'm still just a rat in a Facebook thread. <laughs> okay. Folks, we have to come to terms with the uncomfortable fact that anger is never presented in a positive light in the New Testament. We're repeatedly warned against letting it get the upper hand in our lives. There are basically two words in our New Testament that refer to anger. The one word that is usually translated anger refers to kind of a steady, sort of teeth grinding, simmering anger. That's usually translated anger. The other term refers to this sort of violent lashing out 
at someone. Um, that term's usually rendered rage. Um, it, the rage is sort of like when you give someone the old, the old baseball manager to the umpire treatment, right? Where you get right in their face and really let them have it. Anger and wrath are closely related because anger oftentimes morphs into wrath. Right? And both of these terms are not consistent with Paul's fruit of the Spirit. And so he says in no uncertain terms in his letters, get rid of all, put away all anger and wrath. And that word all, put away all anger and wrath, that's a very nuanced, that's a very sophisticated uh, Greek term. Do you know what that means? What all means? It means all. <laughs> yeah, it's very nuanced. It just means all. Right? Hmm. And we need to be super careful in the age of rage about finding ways to justify our anger because if there's one thing that every one of us is good at, it's self-deception. We'll even drag in the Bible to justify our behavior. What about Jesus? He got angry. We can go chapter and verse on this. Jesus got angry at religious professionals and institutions that put more emphasis on ceremonial minutia than in the weightier matters of justice and mercy. Is that what we're angry about? Or I hear this one sometimes. Well, Case, my, my Bible says in Ephesians to be angry and sin not. Okay, that verse actually is better translated is when you are angry or if you are angry, do not sin. And immediately after that, Paul says, don't let the sun go down on your anger, meaning make amends with someone as quickly as possible or else that's going to turn into bitterness. And then the one I hear a lot, and you've probably heard this in the age of rage, the gospel is offensive, you know. You're just being nice, but the gospel is offensive. Listen, folks, that phrase, the offense of the gospel that Paul uses, this is what that means. For Paul, the offense of the gospel is that the very Christ of God has been crucified by sinful people. That's what that phrase means. That is not a license to offend people. People are not one to Jesus by being offended. That's not the way it works. Okay? No one has ever been one to Christ because you were nasty to them. It doesn't work that way. Probably the most substantive response to what I'm saying today is if someone says, look, not being angry, that's a luxury. Only those people not in danger, not on the business end of a gun, not disadvantaged by an unjust law. It's only those folks that can afford not being angry. In other words, say to me, Case, look, if you were the one on the margins, or if you were the one who had the crosshairs on your back, you'd have a whole different perspective on anger, a whole different perspective on anger. I suspect there's some truth to that. I'm sure that when someone's life is in danger, yes, a visceral response is sometimes called for because the innocent are going to get hurt. I'm sure that when entire communities are at risk, anger is understandable. But let me say this, and this is the crucial part, when that happens, the appropriate response is to take that anger and channel it in productive and constructive directions. What the great, late great author Terry Pratchett once referred to as militant decency. I wish I had more time to, to reflect on that this morning. The point I'm trying to make is that as a basic disposition in our lives, anger has no place. It often leads to payback, to revenge. And in this age of rage, we need to be reminded that Christians are never, ever called to this. Now, are we going to screw up? Are we going to lose our temper occasionally? Of course. Of course. 
But surely what we do then is apologize and make things right, not try to justify our behavior. So what are we supposed to do when there's so much anger around us, when it seems like it consumes more and more of us? Uh, there's an old song that says, being angry is a full-time job. The holiness tradition, of which the Wesleyan Church is a part, has had a lot to say about how our basic dispositions are reoriented which includes dealing with things like anger. The way this happens is through what John Wesley meant by entire sanctification or Christian perfection. This is kind of a jeopardy question asking this congregation, but how many of you have at least heard that phrase, entire sanctification or Christian perfection? Interesting. Wesley uses this language to describe this event in which the Holy Spirit purifies our hearts and sets us apart for service to God, to love God and to love our neighbor and to reorient our basic disposition. Now when he talks about sanctification, he actually talks about reorienting our tempers far more than he does about avoiding all of the favorite uh, vices. Do not drink, do not smoke. If you're of a certain generation, don't dance, right? Don't go to movies. Wesley, he really doesn't talk about that kind of thing. Right? I mean, he talks about having your tempers uh, reoriented. Um, for example, in one of his uh, sermons, he says, uh, Oh, beware of touchiness. Oh, beware of testiness of starting at the last word. Do you know what that starting at, at, the, at the last word means? It's when someone says something to you and you respond by, let me tell you something, right? And Wesley talks about reorienting our basic dispositions. Some preachers in a previous generation would have said, when he does this, he goes from preaching to meddling, right? It's okay to talk about all the safe topics, but if you actually put your finger on the way we behave, you're not preaching anymore, you're meddling. Right? Wesley can even write this way when he describes a sanctified person. Listen to this, this is a quote. A person strikes me, but instead of striking back with anger, my heart instantly overflows with love. Now, when I read that in class, it usually gets a round of laughter from the students. You know. um, true story, I used to do a theological experiment in which I would read that passage and invite a student forward to slap me on the face just to demonstrate how far I have to go down the road of sanctification. I suspect Houghton Legal was not really impressed with that experiment. You know. <laughs> Wesley himself thought that this process was very lengthy and it was completed shortly before death. But Americans do not like to wait. And in the 19th century, some American theologians began to shorten this process up and they began to introduce a practice that some of you will be familiar with and it was popular right up until a few decades ago. Of course, I'm talking about the altar call. I see a lot of folks with hair like mine in this crowd. How many of you are familiar with the old school altar calls, right? Boy, the preacher would get all frothed up, all lathered up, and then the organ would start at the end and, and you'd have the altar call. Um, if you don't know, the way it worked was like this. You'd have the message, and then the call would be to open the altar to come up and to either receive Christ or in the holiness tradition, to lay your all on the altar. And in that moment, the Holy Spirit would sanctify you, would reorient those basic dispositions. And you were to rise and go forth from being an Alex to being, what, a Dolly Parton, okay? The key word here was instantaneous. Right? What I'm describing that was the distinctive that set the Wesleyans and the Free Methodists and the Nazarenes apart from all of the other denominations. That was our distinctive. 
All theological traditions have distinctives. I mean, the Catholics had papal infallibility. The Baptists had inerrancy. The Calvinists had predestination. They didn't have a choice on that one. Right. Okay. <laughs> but in terms of spiritual superpowers, the Charismatics had healing and speaking in tongues. We had entire sanctification. That was our silver bullet. That was kryptonite against the carnal nature. And if we ever lost that distinctive, well, we, we'd just be like any other vanilla, plain evangelical church with no sprinkles on top of any sort. We would just be this sort of generic evangelical church. The problem was, and there's a lot of you in this congregation that, that know this, that can relate to this, that experience was easily lost. So Monday morning rolled around, you were back to being an Alex. So what that meant was you had to continually try to generate that experience. When family camp rolled around every summer, Pine Grove Campground, Saratoga Springs, New York, I could get saved and sanctified half a dozen times in a single week. Why do you think so many people my generation, we know all the verses of just as I am, every time they played it, we were at the altar. Right? There are some pastors at the altar saying, hold on, hold on to Jesus, brother. Other pastors were going, just let go, let go. I didn't know what to do. I'm supposed to be holding on and letting go. Eventually, some folks began to have doubts about this whole process. And so even the language of entire sanctification became a turnoff to a lot of people. I think most holiness churches today realize that that instantaneous solution is not really the way it works for most people. That reorienting our basic dispositions or tempers takes a long time and it takes a great deal of honesty before God. The crucial missing circuit in how all of this was supposed to work was the place of the church. Because God uses other brothers and sisters to help effect our sanctification, we really do need each other even on that level. If there's one thing, my friends, that we need to recover in the age of rage, it's the centrality of the church as the school of the Holy Spirit, where we learn to cultivate that fruit in our lives. Because if we are not cultivating gentleness in here, and you all know this is true, it is certainly not being cultivated out there. I leave you today with a warning and a prayer. My prayer is that the body of Christ, us, my prayer is that we would become the chief bulwark against the age of rage, not an accomplice to it. That as people who follow Jesus, we would practice mediating between our euodias and our syntyches that when we cross the line and lose our temper, we learn to apologize. That as our passage says, we, we, take these, we take these disagreements over which we have so much anxiety and we learn to submit them together to Christ in prayer and to encourage each other to be gentle and not engage in the political gamesmanship that we see in Washington, D.C. or in Albany because, and here's my warning, if we imitate that, we will destroy ourselves. If that's the way that we handle disagreements, we will destroy ourselves. Paul writes to another church uh, that is strife-ridden. He writes to the congregation in Galatians, Take care if you bite and devour each other that you do not consume each other. 
Now, some of you might be thinking at the conclusion of all this, well, look, Case, being gentle won't solve our problems. And you're right. That in itself won't solve our problems. But increasing rage will only make things worse. And while I'm no prophet, nor the son of a prophet, I think we're entering a very dangerous time in our cultural and political life. Developing gentleness will not by itself resolve any problem. It is not what we call a sufficient condition, but it is a necessary one. Try resolving any conflict without it and see what happens. I ask you all this morning, as my friends in Christ, what about us is evident to all? May Christ, through his Holy Spirit, continue to sanctify us as we seek to cultivate the fruit of gentleness in our lives in the age of rage. I thank you for, all, I thank you for your kind attention this morning. God bless you.